I remember it being brutally cold. I got there pretty quick. A black pickup was lodged against a tree. We've all got our high-powered flashlights, and we're all on our hands and knees trying to find evidence. At the bottom of the ditch, very hastily covered with some leaves and a stick, there was a body of a young male. There were multiple gunshot wounds. I received a phone call from the dispatch that a body had been found next to a pickup in a ditch on a road is known as Substation Road. On the way, I was hearing radio traffic of a possible suspect could be walking down the road north of that. So I kind of decided to check it out on the way, and I came across an individual walking northbound on the highway. He's wearing a suit with a white shirt with tie, had a trench coat on, and I found that odd at that time of the morning. I made a quick U-turn in behind him. He spun around. Um, not knowing whether he had a weapon or not, I drew my weapon and ordered him on the ground. And I said, I'm going to ask you one time, do you have a weapon on you? And he said, no, but I am the guy you're trying to find. I'm the guy that killed the guy on Substation Road. My name is Undersheriff J.T. Palmer. Me and you met on the side of Highway 177 in about Sing Road at about 312 this morning, didn't we? Yes, sir. Okay, and what do you remember telling me? Uh, in summation that I'm guilty, yes. Of what? Of murder. Okay, and who did you murder? Uh, Gennaro. I do not know how to spell that, but it is with a G. Okay, and then how did you murder him? With a gun. I shot him in the head twice. And you go to school with him? Yes, sir. Was that his pickup or your pickup? I'm fairly sure it was his, sir. Okay, and do you remember what kind of pickup that was? Uh, black. Okay, now. And how did you guys hook up? I went down to his dorm room and asked if I could be given a ride to Walmart in exchange for $20 gas money. We pulled into the parking lot, then I pulled the uh, weapon on him and demanded that he take me to Asher, Oklahoma, sir. And okay, why did all of a sudden did you decide that you need to go to Asher? because I was planning to take him out into the country and kill him. And so I guess at some point, did you decide it was, now was the time? Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, shot once, missed, shot a second time, hit, jumped out of the car, went around, he was driving 10, 15 miles an hour, so it was out until he already had hit the tree. I heard him a gurgling. Uh, I'm not sure if that was a physiological or physical process after death, but uh, I thought that he might have still lived through that somehow because he was gurgling, so I shot him again and then shoved him down in the ditch. And then I tried to cover it, uh, admittedly not well, with uh, leaves, dirt, and uh, stick. And so, after you got the body covered up, what did you do then? I uh, headed back to the truck and uh, tried to get it unstuck. And so you could get the truck out, so what did you do then? Then I walked away. I headed north. And in my mind, I'm thinking, wow. And I never had interviewed anybody that had been that cold and callous. You killed a young man? Yes, sir. Why did you do it? If I'm pressed to answer, I'll say it's to prove the strength of my resolve. But that's only if I'm pressed to answer. I'm not pressing you, I'm just trying to understand. Then I don't know why. Okay. So it just... Popped in my head. And why him? Uh, all the kids in college here, why, why him? I believed that he would have had the least impact, sir. Impact of what? Ah. Uh, I believed he didn't have many friends, or many close friends, I should rephrase. His absence would be less notable. You don't think your girlfriend would miss him? You don't think she's going to be upset, heartbroken? I think she will be, sir. How does that make you feel? 
No difference, sir. Or are you just going to kill anybody else? No, sir. Tell me why I should believe you that there just was going to be one person that was going to suffer from your consequences of killing. You have no reason to believe me, sir. Do you feel any remorse? No. What do you think should happen to you? Death sentence, sir. And why do you think you deserve a death sentence? An eye for an eye, sir. doing a lot of interviews and I've had them where they're crying and they're upset, they get mad. He didn't. He looked you right in the eye on every question. Probably the only interview that I ever did that the hair kind of stood up on the back of my neck. This is pure evil talking to me. Jared Murray's defense counsel had him evaluated. They very quickly found him to meet the clinical, the legal findings of not guilty by reason of, of insanity. Antisocial personality disorder. The characteristics are a flat effect, a lack of empathy, a lack of impulse control, and a bunch of other things that fit Gerard Murray to a T. Gerard Murray was going to a secure facility where the high risk the very dangerous people that are found not guilty by reason of insanity are sent. But 15 years from now, he's going to learn how to play the system. He's a highly intelligent and highly dangerous man. Is there a chance he can be released? Absolutely, he can. I was angry. I was livid. He's not in the place where he should be. He should be in prison. He's had the taste for blood. He got away with it once. And so he would try to do it again. I think that if he ever got out, everybody around him would be in danger because you just don't know what would set him off. The law changed. This protects everybody. My son's life had meaning, and his death will have meaning. Mr. Dobson had severe brain damage from the, the gunshot wounds. And at the time, the prognosis was very touch and go. Miss Fowler was on life support for a little bit and just, she died from her injuries. Through friends and relatives, we learned that Mary and James worked together. They were just friends. And from my understanding, they went out for the night. As far as where they were going, you know, we still did not know. But we learned that Mr. Dobson had his parents' car, which was a Hyundai. And we learned that this car was missing. We put out a bolo to all the agencies in the close proximity. We knew we had to have that car and that car eventually would lead us to a suspect. Uh, 
I was patrolling in through the rural area, and I noticed a uh, young Caucasian male sitting in a vehicle on the side of the road. It was a uh, Hyundai Elantra. And I said, I need to see a license, a registration. He handed me a, a license, and I looked down, and I saw the name uh, John Villarreal. So when we first get there, I look in the car, and one of the first things I noticed was the blood that was in the driver's seat and the, the, the passenger seat of the car, dried blood. We find some shell casings. In the car, they find several firearms, 22s, which match what has struck our victims. And we found several silencers. We found a Bible with Mr. Villarreal's name in it. From a name tag, we learned that his nickname was Jack. We also found Ledger with his name on it. In this ledger, he was writing down a plan to go rescue this girl that he met online from the situation she was in. The ultimate goal is to get a confession. You know, we need to get the facts and the story of what happened, what took place inside that car. Well, what's going on? What, why are we? I'd like to know. I mean, I want to know what's going on. I don't know what we're even talking about. It doesn't make sense, but the point is that it's the only explanation I have. He was going through that interview just playing oblivious, like he didn't have any idea, didn't know anything about anything. I just wasn't buying it. We know that he's lying to us. I was headed out to my car when the desk officer ran out the back door and said, hey, he's banging on the door and he's hollering for a detective. So I turned around, went back inside, um, opened the door and just said, listen, uh, if you want to run us down the same stuff we've been going over for the last two hours, we're not here for that, OK? But if you want to go upstairs and you want to really talk about what really happened, then we're all ears. All right, are we in audio records? Yes, sir. Good. I want a copy of it sent to my family, too. I'm not here for a question answer session. I'm here to tell you what happened. Okay. Why? Well, my man is going to turn over. What I'm going to tell you is going to make your jaw drop, probably. Let's go back to the night before Christmas Eve. I get a message from my girl telling me that her stepdad has been beating her, etc. Mm -hmm. So immediately I jumped and I said, if I could steal a car and come down there right now and get you out of there and get you somewhere safe, I said, would you do it? And she said, yes. I expected that when I got down to her place, I expected someone to pull a gun on me. Okay, and I expected at that point to go ahead and just whack everybody in there and try not to think about it. Tell us what happened Christmas Eve morning. I didn't want to hurt anybody originally. Well, they were rolling along down Fletcher Street, in fact, when I came across them. I had my pack on my back, my rain suit still on, cap on my head. And I asked them if they could take me to I-85. He said, do you have some gas money? I said, you know, how much do you want? Five bucks. I said, okay, five bucks. Who was in the car? The man and the woman. Mm -hmm. Don't know their names. Don't know okay. the care. But I hope he survives, to be honest with you. And I got in that car. And we started going. And they were as nice as anything. And then the man offered to take me to the Georgia line. He said he had the time to do it. So you do it for 25 bucks and yes, money. 
reasonable enough. So when he said this, were you already in the car? I was in the car. We were going down I-85 at that point. Mm -hmm. As we were driving down the road, I got to a point where I was ready to try to commandeer the car. And you know what? I told him I had to take a leak. Asked him to pull over. Classic move. They never suspected it. You know what? In the moment, I presumed the man was armed. As a result, I didn't try to commandeer the car. But I assumed. Okay? I didn't even give him a chance to show a gun. Driver's sitting here directly in front of me, headrests in between. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in the left passenger seat. Passenger's here. The first thing you do is you take in. The first thing you do is tell yourself, don't think about it, don't feel. Because you can't do it if you think, because you know what's wrong. And you take aim, perfect aim, boom, one in the head with her. She slumps over. Before the man can react, I screw over quick, boom. I missed, I hit his neck. Then I put three rounds right in his neck because I was trying to hit the head, but I was trying to shoot too quick because I wanted to get it done. I didn't really want to shoot him, didn't really want to do it, and I did. For two days after that, I prayed for that man to survive. Because once I realized that I had hit him in the neck, I realized he might survive. I kept praying. And I kept praying for forgiveness. And the thing is, the Lord can't give forgiveness if you don't, if you don't tell the truth. If you lie about it, you're going to hell. The only time he was really emotional was when he was talking about God and getting into heaven. Nothing else mattered to him. I think he started telling us what really took place because he just needed that little bit of alone time to talk with the man upstairs and, you know, it was time. Emergency. I need an emergency right now. The shooting at the, uh, the corner store next to CVS. Okay, do you, okay. Do you know if anyone's been hit? Good, good. Get an ambulance here now. We are. Who was hit? Some young man. So he's bleeding to death. Somebody just shot this kid three times. Okay, we got everyone in route to him right now. Look, this guy is dying. I'm okay. Not this guy is dying. The victim was eventually identified by his identification being found in his wallet as Joseph Edward Ross. He was eventually transported to the hospital where he passed. Our crime scene comes, takes photographs, really documents what's going on. Because there is a lot of activity, crowds start developing. So we start going up to those crowds. Hey, did you see what happened? Did you hear what happened? The witness at the scene uh, observed the victim walking through the parking lot, talking on a phone, and arguing. And shortly thereafter, they observed a red Dodge pickup truck pull into the parking lot. Do you have any idea why we might be here? Okay, your brother Joe was shot and killed around the corner, over at the corner store. He was shot? Yes. We're trying to find out what happened to him. Do you know anybody that drives like a red Dodge pickup truck? Oh, my friend Nate does. Who's Nick? It's just someone that I met through a friend. What does he look like? Is he white or black? He's white. Okay. And he always hangs out with a black dude. Do you know the, the black male's name? I think it's Gerald. What else do you know about Nick? 
you know, only carries a 38 or a 9 mil. Has he ever gotten into it with your brother, Cole? They argue about a lot of stupid stuff. Nick's really, he seems like he's crazy. I wouldn't really want to mess with him. Jonathan Ross said Nicholas Stern was 23 years old, um, a small-time drug dealer who, who was out of work. All the links with the Red Dodge pickup truck, the history between the two of them, the subject being armed on a regular basis, that obviously then at that point propelled Nicholas Nairing to being the suspect that we were looking for. Before we entered the room to interview Nick, he was sleeping. This referred to as the perp nap. Someone who's typically guilty will actually fall asleep in the interrogation room because they're so exhausted from the stress associated with waiting to be arrested. Nick, right? <laughs> Well, I'm Detective Barnett. This is Detective Parsons. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fall asleep. That's happens. It's okay. <clears throat> you have any idea what this is about? Mm, no, I don't know. It's um, gunpoint. Got on the car. Got out of the car. Yeah, but do you know what? Anything that you, you have an idea what left that? No, not. Now, when you were stopped, you had a couple of guns on you? Mm hmm. I was going to go shooting range. I just put, turn the corner. And the lights went on. Okay. Well, while we're here to investigate something happened earlier tonight, and we're wondering if you could tell us what happened tonight with you. At midnight, um, I was at home for the longest time. Is there any reason that your truck would have been at the CVS around the corner tonight? No. It shouldn't have been. Then how was it there? <clears throat> the reason that it was there mm -hmm. is because something happened there. Okay. He's very engaged right now. He's up at the table, he's close in, he's in a very strong position. And at first, I'm back, so I move in to show that I also have a very firm position in my assertion that his vehicle is there. If it seems as though I'm not sure, he'll take that and he'll run with it. And that allows him to have an escape. You had so, three guns on you tonight? Yeah, one person, yeah. You fired any of them tonight? No. Okay. Well, let's just say, for example, that maybe it's not one of the three that you had on you. It doesn't alleviate the fact that you were there when shots are fired. No way. You were involved in something tonight. At that location, mm -hmm. and I'd like to hear your side of what happened there. When he's feeling threatened, he starts to back up, and the hand that he's able to actually goes into his pocket. So it's another defense mechanism that he's using where he's hiding and concealing what actually happened. You can choose to be deceptive all you want. Okay. I have never seen you on the side of town. Me, what I'm points about you? This, this thing is this: is that you were there because people wrote down the tag number of your truck there. Okay. No, the truck shouldn't have been there. Wasn't my possession. It was there. Wasn't my possession. Line. But you were there. I wasn't there. Yeah, you were. How do you know that? Video cameras. Did you see me in my vehicle? You kind of just did. So I'm guessing that thing had full video around the whole camera. Or the whole story? I'm not. I'm not even there's video everywhere because there's not. At that point, I didn't have video of the shooting, but he's nodding because now he believes it. So with him, I felt comfortable throwing out the bluff in such a way because I didn't think he was going to call me on it, and I thought he would accept it. I lost him. That explains why it comes right in my ass. Does lying help you? Lying will never sh. Stop it. Why did you do what you did? Put the truth. Yes. Motherfucker's a Okay? That's straight up honesty. Motherfucker's a Okay? He deserved it. He researched for nothing. Shot the motherfucker's face. He made a uh noise. I shot the No fucking mind. That's it. His true face comes out. And it comes out in grand fashion. We were speechless. He just didn't care. It was just. It was pure evil. They were like, they had consequences. We need to do this. Yeah, you right. I up because I used my truck and the 
Okay. From the very beginning of this investigation, it was a whodunit. And within hours, we had the suspect in custody. We had a confession. We had him charged, and he was on his way to jail. Nick Nearing was sentenced to life in prison. That confession showed that he planned to kill Joseph from the very beginning. And it showed his mindset that he did not care. There's no chance of Nick getting out ever. He'll die in prison, and that's probably best, because I do believe that he would kill again if he had the chance.